Good morning and a very warm welcome to you all. My name is Nens van Alphen. I'm an Associate Professor of Neurology and I'm the local host and organizer of the 2021 online ICCNMI course and conference. We are very happy to announce that we've made a very special addition to this conference with the help of CADWELL, who have sponsored and taken care of a very interactive live demo session in three continents of the world for you. You can find out more on this web page, which also has the access link for all three sessions that you might want to attend. These are free live online demos and with an interactive component so you can ask anything you like and your local host will try to show this to you. Here are the sessions. We've set one up in Asia, coming from Singapore. We've set one up in Europe for you, coming from Rome and Italy. And we've set one up for the Americas, coming live to you from Sao Paulo in Brazil. All the sessions are geared towards your lunch hour in the local time set zone. Obviously, you can also watch them from other parts of the world. Now let's see our speakers. We've got three renowned hosts who are very experienced neuromuscular ultrasound scanners themselves. In the Asian session, Dr. Joy Vijayan will come to you from Singapore, demonstrating you his techniques and take on neuromuscular ultrasound. In Europe, we've got the honor to meet the founding father of the ISPNI Society, Luca Padua, who will teach you from his office in Rome everything he knows about scanning. You can just ask him for any special tips and tricks. And finally, in Americas, Dr. Ana Lucila Moreira from Sao Paulo, Brazil, will be your live host and show you any technique that you might want her to demonstrate. Incidentally, she will also be the next year's host of the ICCNMI 2022 event, so please watch out for that as well. So join us for these free live demos brought to you by the ISPNI in cooperation with Cadwell. You can access them from these links below. If you're interested, you can also still subscribe to the full conference and the digital material will also be available offline after the event ends. We sincerely hope we can meet you there and happy scanning everybody. Hello everyone. It's a pleasure for me to host this session and to represent the entire American continent uh, in this live demonstration of neuromuscular ultrasound. And I'd like to thank you, uh, Cadwell, for sponsoring the event. It's very important for us, for the organization of ICCNMI. And here I have with me uh, a Cadwell machine, um, which, with which I can do electroneuromography. And um, along with the electroneuromography, I can do neuromuscular ultrasound at the same time. So I'll demonstrate some nerves uh, using this machine. And as soon as you, you have some questions, you can stop me and, and send the questions via chat. And I'll try to answer as soon as I can. And um, so I have some uh, predetermined sites to show you. Here uh, I have to present you uh, our model today is my husband, Paulo, which is a clinical neurophysiologist too. And uh, he is my... Uh, loved uh, and uh, loved mate for this uh, entrepreneur, which has been a neuromuscular ultrasound. And I love doing uh, this kind of examination and he's always here to, to help me and to serve as a model. So let's start with uh, medium nerve. And I'll show you some uh, specific points for, for this examination and some landmarks as well uh, to make it easier to examine. So we start with medial nerve always because it's the easiest nerve to, to scan and it's very superficial and it's common for us to know where it is and how to examine this nerve. So here we have it in the center of the scream and here the uh, lunate bone. So we are uh, at the wrist and we can see some landmarks here very easily. So scaphoid bone, uh, the flexor carpi radialis tendon 
here. And when you do such a movement like this, you, you can test the anisotropy uh, effect, which has been um, explained to you during the, the conference. So uh, here, when you rotate the, the uh, when you toggle the, the transducer like this, you can see the tendons becoming brighter or darker, uh, assuming that the position and the angle of insulation affects the, this kind of tissue more than the nerves. So the nerve doesn't change much when you toggle the, the transducer. And continue with landmarks. Here you have the pisiform bone ulnar nerve and ulnar artery as well. So it's possible being here uh, to stop this examination. So let me just stop it here. And then uh, to make a measurement of the area of the nerve. Here. And then we can proceed. You can see that the, uh, the machine already changed the, the, the examination site for forearm. So we will proceed to forearm. And when you do, uh, you, we do the, the measurements at the forearm, uh, the machine will run automatically with uh, the, the calculation of the uh, relation wrist uh, from to forearm. Let me just do this. Uh, this is not the machine I use in my in my daily uh, clinical practice, but it's very easy to to use. So uh, here are the measurements, and uh, for here, let me see where can I see the uh, the index. Do you know, Paulo? Life to ref, no, no. Yeah, it had to be here, the, the calculation of the risk for arm ratio. See? Pass out. Yeah, it's saved. But it's not showing here in the, the screen. I don't know why, but uh, I've tried before and yeah, I don't know why, but it's not showing here. But uh, usually the machine uh, has uh, another uh, table here showing the, the risk for arm ratio. So it's much more close to us as clinical neurophysiologists as we already work with this kind of setup uh, using electroneuromyography. But let's move on. So uh, here in the forearm, you can see very easily the radial artery here, and flexor digitorum superficialis, the median nerve, and flexor digitorum profundus. And here is radius and ulnar, and here the interosseous membrane. And we can easily uh, go up with this examination, and we continue following the nerve here, and as soon as uh, we get more proximal, uh, we have to change depth just to, s to continue following the nerve, uh, seeing what is around the nerve here. And I'll just increase gain a little bit to just to become it more uh, uh, brighter than, than we have before. And then you can follow the nerve when we pass uh, behind the, the pronator teres, yeah. And at this point, you can see that the nerve becomes a little bit harder to, to follow because it changes uh, its uh, angle, of course. And uh, when it changes the, the angle, uh, it changes the signal of the nerve. So uh, here it's very easy to see, so we can follow very easy. And then when we pass behind this uh, muscular mass here, it becomes a little bit 
darker and less clear for the, the, the ultrasound. But uh, soon, as soon as you get more superficial here at the antecubital fossa, it becomes uh, visible again. And you can follow again the nerve uh, very easily besides the, the brachial artery here. So uh, when you come more proximal, it accompanies the, the brachial artery here. And let me just, no, it's not necessary to diminish so, so much the depth. And we can see the nerve going up. And normally, it will pass from the medial side to the lateral side as it is originated uh, from the lateral cord. So in the proximal side, you will have the nerve uh, going to the lateral side of the artery here. Let me just put a little bit more gel and so it's always necessary to use a lot of gel because uh, this could compromise your image if you do not have the coupling of the surface with the, the transducer to show uh, correctly the nerve. So when you come more proximal, the nerve became lateral to the artery and it will be seen at the, the axillary region uh, as the lateral cord here. So in this region, you also see the medial cord here. And sometimes it's a little bit difficult to see the posterior cord because of the posterior enhancement of the, uh, the artery and the veins. And if you do not press the transducer, you will see a lot of enhancement. If you press, it's a little bit easier. But the posterior cord is located uh, in this region. And you can also change uh, the, the position of the transducer to show uh, this cord uh, with more uh, more details than we have now. But for the superficial structures, it's very easy to see. So lateral cord and medial cord. And from now on, we'll just go down following the medial cord. And it will become uh, the main uh, terminal nerve is the ulnar nerve. So it follows his medial path uh, in, in the superficial part uh, uh, related to the, the triceps muscle. And it will perforate the, the, the medial septum here, the intermuscular septum, and become uh, inside, become its path inside the tri triceps muscle. And when we come, let me just put this in the middle of the screen. Uh, when we come down in the, the arm, go into the, the elbow, uh, it becomes superficial again. So let me just put a little bit more gel again. And then I'll just put the arm. Let me just put here, yeah. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, I have a model who already knows how to position himself to, to be better for examination. So, uh, And here we'll have the nerve uh, entering in the uh, in the elbow. And it's related to the medial epicondyle here. And now we can proceed uh, to the distal part, going uh, down between the, the flexor ulnar, flexor carpi ulnaris. Uh, the nerve is here in the cubital tunnel. So here we have a very good uh, image of the nerve. And you always have to be careful, because you can see uh, a structure pulsating here. It's the collateral ulnar artery. And uh, sometimes it's near the nerve. So we have another branch uh, pulsating here. You can see 
Uh, if you pay attention, you will see that it's moving. So you are not supposed to outline this nerve uh, with this structure uh, inside the, the area that you outlined. So it's, uh, it's very important to, to be careful because it can uh, falsely um, augment the area that you attribute to the nerve. So when you go down, uh, the nerve, now it's outside the, the, the cubital tunnel and it's below the flexor carpi ulnaris and uh, between the flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor digitorum profundus. And in his path going down, he will be uh, in the middle of the, the forearm, uh, it will be descending alongside uh, the art ulnar artery. And then, let me just pick up a little bit more gel again. And then it will follow until the wrist at the pisiform bone where I, I already showed you, uh, where it, it's, it's located uh, between the ulnar artery and the pisiform bone. So it's very easy to identify and it's, it's a very good tool to localize lesion and to define some lesions that we don't have, uh, we are not so sure just using electroneuromography. And uh, from now on, you can just follow the nerve, like here you can see the nerve uh, splitting here. And this is the level of the hook of Heimig, it's which is here. So here is the superficial uh, branch and here is the deep branch. And you can easily follow if, if you have a lesion, uh, it will be enlarged and it will be very easy to follow. So now you saw not only nerves, but you already saw uh, some muscles as well. And it's very easy to identify when you when you know uh, anatomy, and it's important to know anatomy if you are a clinical neurophysiologist, it's very important uh, to recognize these structures using ultrasound as well. And I can assure you that uh, using ultrasound enhance your, your power to recognize structures just looking for uh, the superficial part of the, the body because you are used to do ultrasound and you know where, is the, where are the muscles that you need to use for electroneuromography, for example. And this is uh, very important when you consider, for example, uh, forearm muscles. So uh, it was shown uh, before, but it's possible to isolate some groups of muscle, like the flexor of the index, for example just flex the index, and then just the third. Let me just, just, yeah, no, let me just put a little bit more, yeah. And the most difficult, the fourth, but Paulo can do it. And it's easy to see where the muscle is, is contracting. And then the fifth. And there is our ulnar nerve here as well. And here, our median nerve. And now the thumb. You can flex the thumb, you can abduct the thumb. And it's easier to localize muscles using ultrasound. So I'll, I'll not show you uh, small nerves in in the, in, in the cutaneal, cutaneal nerves, for example, uh, because I would need uh, a transducer of more of higher frequency, and this goes from 4 to 14, and it's not that easy to, to see some uh, very small nerves. But even uh, with those, with this uh, transducer, let me just uh, show you. Uh, because Paulo is a very good 
model, but uh, even with this transducer, for example, it's possible to, to see here we are in the arm, seeing the basilic vein, and here along, alongside the basilic vein is the cut medial cutaneous uh, nerve of the forearm, for example. So even with this kind of uh, transducer, which is m not so high frequency, frequency as uh, we can be, uh, you can see where the nerves are, and if there is a, a pathology here, you would recognize using this transducer tube. So it has a very good um, discrimination between points, so here you can see even the fascicles of the, the nerve, and it's, it's a very small nerve, so this is important to show because uh, sometimes you can uh, think that using a, a machine like this, you can be uh, much um, um, pred, uh, um, uh, that, that it cannot be so good because it's not a dedicated machine. I'll, I'll change my, my words because English is not my modern language, so sometimes it's a little bit difficult to find the words. But uh, here you can see that even using this kind of transducer, you can see the nerve. And it's important to know anatomy when you do ultrasound. It's, it's not only uh, to, to hold the, the transducer and, and doing images uh, randomly. You, you have to know what you expect to find and where you expect to find. Uh, and if you don't know, uh, it's very difficult to do ultrasound without this knowledge. So let's change a little bit to do radial nerve. No, I see Yeah, I usually do uh, start the, the examination with the patient uh, laying supine like this uh, with the arm extended. And we'll see briefly the, the nerve in the uh, spiral groove here. And for going to the proximal side, I'll ask the patient to put the, the hand in the shoulder or uh, and Sorry? Or uh, uh, up in the chest here. And this will allow you to, to see the nerve in a more proximal side. But I'll start the spiral groove. So let's see how, how you can do. So um, once you palpate the lateral epicondyle here, you just go 12 centimeters uh, up. And this is, let me just adjust that. And this is the point where you usually see, like here, the radial nerve. So it's running, let me just put a little bit more depth to it. It's um, along with the, the deep brachial artery, which is pulsating here, you can see. if. I stand still, so the nerve is here and the artery is here. And as you go down, the nerve passes, so here is proximal, let me so show proximal first. Here proximal and the artery. And put the arm there, Paul, for me. Yeah. And you can go more proximal if you want. So sometimes it is a little bit harder because of the the it's it's deeper than in the the spiral roof, but you can follow for for sure. And uh, I feel it's very difficult in case of trauma because sometimes here is uh, the the muscle is compromised as well and it's too wide. But uh, for our model is very good and you can follow until very proximal site. So you can uh, spend some time here if you want or if you need, uh, depending on the, the suspicion that you have. Uh, and you can go as proximal as you, you wish until uh, the posterior cord. But now we'll go down. And in this place, 
we have the nerve crossing the lateral intermuscular septum, which is here, and becoming uh, in its way to the anticubital fossa between the brachioradialis and the brachialis here. And here, let me just adjust the focus. So here you have the nerve, and it's not, uh, it, it has not splitted yet, but it will split soon in superficial and deep branch. So now you can see both branches, uh, superficial, superficial and deep branch, and you will choose normally to follow one and, the, and afterwards the other. So I'll follow the, the deep branch, and it will go, let me just put some gel in here because it's becoming difficult to follow the nerve. So change a little bit the position here. And here you see the deep branch. So it's going down. Uh, to the radial tunnel here, and it will pass between the heads of supinator muscle. So it's going down here and passing between the two heads of supinator muscle. So it becomes uh, so thin that in normal people that uh, sometimes you just see like a, a line here, um, a hypoecogenic line, but it's it's easy to identify if you if you know the landmarks. So um, this is the importance of knowing some uh, specific images to, to identify this structure. So this is one image that you have to keep in mind when you examine radial nerve. So you have here the supinator muscle and the uh, posterior interosseous nerve here inside the two layers of the supinator muscle. And uh, you can just follow its course uh, going down and going out of the, the supinator tunnel. And um, at the distal part of the forearm, you will uh, see the nerve besides the, the posterior interosseous artery here in the extensor tunnel. So it's, it's possible to, to follow the nerve even in more uh, distal sites when the nerve is, uh, where the nerve is a little, uh, very small, very small. So another key point to identificate uh, nerve lesions is to know what is the territory of muscle innervation uh, that is related to the nerve you are investigating. So uh, sometimes when you do nerve examination like this, you do not know uh, about the, the, the condition of the nerve because sometimes it's a little bit messy here because of trauma, for example. But you can uh, register which muscles are involved. So knowing the, the, the distribution of the, the muscle lesion, you will know uh, in where, where is the point where the, the nerve uh, was involved. So now we'll follow the superficial branch. So we'll go down following this branch here. And you can see that it's near um, to the radial, arter radial artery, which is here. It's pulsating here, and the, the superficial branch is here. And you can follow the nerve, and it's very easy to, to see, and you can also see fascicular uh, structures here, and you can follow until distal, here, and at this distal part, we usually use uh, this location to stimulate uh, superficial radial nerves, so if you do not remember 
the landmarks of ultrasound. Remember lateral diagnostic studies, uh, studies and they will guide you uh, where to find the nerve. So here is the nerve and uh, once it becomes more superficial, let me just Let me just be more superficial and then, um, I'm sorry, I'm not that used to this machine, but yeah. So here is the superficial radial nerve. Here is the radius, radial artery. And then I'll become more and more superficial and it will become subcutaneous. And it will distribute uh, it, its branches as we are used to. So uh, this nerve here is related to the, to the compartments uh, of the extensor tendon. So it crosses uh, the first compartment and it will become a more superficial and then branch to the, the skin of this area of the hand. Do we have a question? No? So people get involved. Uh, do some questions, ask me what to do. Uh, I can do all nerves here. It will take some time, but uh, yeah, we can follow each nerve. Do we have any suggestion? No, no, nothing. nothing? So let's see uh, the examination of the diaphragm. So we'll follow the cranial to distal uh, distribution and we'll, we may try some brachial plexus as well. So for, uh, I'll, I'll continue to use this setup because I don't think it's, it's necessary to, to change. Let me just adjust that and the focus as well. Just to show you what are the structures I'm showing here. So here we have uh, one rib here and another one here. So we have this shadow related to the, the bone and this is, uh, this is not a real image, it's just, just artifactual because of the bone. And here we have the abdominal wall muscles here, intercostal muscles here, and the diaphragm here. And as soon as I ask Paulo to breathe, uh, to inspire a little bit more deeply, yeah, the diaphragm gets thicker, yeah, which is here demonstrated. So expire, yeah. And we can identify like uh, these two layers of the diaphragm with the central tendon here. So let's see uh, the pleural line as soon as he inspires. I'll, I'll show you, yeah, here. So here we have abdominal wall, intercostal, and diaphragm with the central tendon here, five pound. And as soon as he inspires, the pleural line goes down and the diaphragm is uh, off the image. Do it again. And we see the diaphragm is very thick here. And we can measure here and then again. Let's do it again. When, when he inspirates. We can measure the, the thickness of the diaphragm. So we use uh, this thickness to, to predict the function of the diaphragm and we can correlate the thickness during maximal inspiration like he, he did now with the, the thickness during expiration and in children uh, this is a little bit harder to do because we need to to wait for them to, to cry sometimes in very little children, those who not have age enough to, to cooperate. 
but it's very easy to, to make. So it's a very superficial uh, structure. And you can see that the, the, all the structures related to the diaphragm here are very well demonstrated and it's very easy to recognize. So even in pathological conditions, it's very easy to do this kind of examination. And um, let me just move forward. Uh, so uh, it's possible to measure the thickness of the intercostal muscles as well. As well. So sometimes people use the intercostal muscles to, to, to the ventilation because uh, they are compromised, uh, they are uh, ill, and they have to use this kind of muscle. And it's very useful to, to see the condition of the intercostal muscles as well. And uh, you can even um, measure the thickness during ins inspiration like we did with diaphragm. And from this place, yeah, let me just show the place where we do the, the examination. So uh, we always use the, the, medial, the median axillary line. And sometimes we can progress to the posterior axillary line. So it's, it's important to keep in mind that you have to, to measure in the opposition zone of the diaphragm. So uh, do not measure in an, an uh, anterior line because it's, it's not good to see the, the thickness of the, the thickening of the diaphragm. So you have to measure in the median line or the posterior line like this. And um, you can show uh, the position. I don't know which of you yeah, have the best image. Uh, yeah, here. So we are spanning two ribs to have the rib, rib, intercostal muscle, and diaphragm in, the, in its zone of opposition, like, like here. In this part, it will not thicken very much. And in this part, it will thicken uh, sufficiently for you to measure. So it's important to follow these instructions uh, to make adequate measurements. And you always uh, are expected to do three measurements uh, to, to talk about the, the condition of the diaphragm. Do, do not do this using only one measurement, please. And um, you can progress when you are doing this examination of the diaphragm with the analysis of the abdominal wall. So here you can see the obliquus externus, obliquus internus, and transversus muscle, and here uh, the abdominal content. So the pleural line, the peritoneal line, and the abdominal content. So it's possible even to, to follow these structures and to progress uh, to the level of the rectus abdominis muscle. So it's very easy to do this examination, for example, to detect fasciculations. And you can see that the, the resolution of the image is very good and you can hold the, the transducer steel and expect for fasciculation, uh, which is a very good contribution for electroneuromography, especially in cases that you cannot uh, confirm the diagnosis of uh, modern neuron disease only with the findings of the, the needle examination. A question? So uh, I have a question here, um, which is the, the protocol for examination of uh, ulnar neuropathy of, of in, in the cubital tunnel. So um, I always do electroneuromography first because this, why, this was my, my main activity always, and I learned to, to examine this, this patient using electroneuromography. And actually, I always think that uh, ultrasound is complementary to, to electroneuromography. So uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, what you find in one examination may not be uh, the same finding in, in the other one. So and in electroneuromography, you can find um, what is the extent of the, the lesion, the axonal 
uh, compromise, for example, and if there is the, the demyelination sinus, for example. But with ultrasound, you can locate the lesion and you can see what is happening to, to the nerve. And for us here in Brazil, we have a major problem with ulnar nerve uh, because we have a lot of uh, leprosy here in our country. So I always say that I would prefer to scan all uh, the ulnar nerves that I see uh, compromised in electroneuromography. So I, I prefer to do uh, the examinations in all the patients that I see any problem. But uh, I always start with electroneuromography, and then uh, I, I don't think I could do the examination uh, just skipping the wrist. I always do uh, from the wrist uh, to proximal sites, and then I'll, I'll show it again. It's a very easy exam, and I'll show you. Um, let me see if I can make it easier for, for you. So here is the pisiform bone, and you can see there are vessels, there are veins here uh, with the, the, the ulnar artery. So ulnar artery here, and you can see even the intima of the, the, the artery here. Yeah, here, you see? And here, ulnar nerve, pisiform bone. And I always say uh, to people that are starting uh, to look at the nerve in a more fast uh, way of examination. So this, this gives you the entire uh, situation very quickly. And you can see what's happening in this nerve in all the locations, and then you can follow doing uh, the detailed examination in each part. And another thing that I didn't show you, do, and Paulo is a good model for, for doing so, uh, is to examine the, the ulnar nerve uh, with dynamic evaluation. So here is the medial epicondyle, the olecranon, and here is the ulnar nerve. Let me just change the, change the gain a little bit and the focus. Yeah, let, no. Here, yeah. So here you can see the, the ulnar nerve. And I'll ask Paulo to do, uh, let me just adjust here the position of this part. So do not prevent you to do the entire movement. And I'll ask Paulo to do, uh, to flex the elbow. And I'll keep my transducer uh, showing the medial epicondyle. So I always uh, keep some control with the, the movement of the patient because otherwise patient will do very fast the, the movement and I'll, I'll, I'll lose the, the image. Uh, but as soon as the, the patient does uh, the flexes the elbow, you could see if the, the, the ulnar nerve uh, luxates uh, for, from the, the, the medial epicondyle or not. In this case, it, it becomes very superficial. It sub subluxates. Don't you luxate your ulnar nerve? Mm. No, no, just subluxate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, my son luxates the, the ulnar nerve and the triceps muscle as well. So sometimes you, you will see the ulnar nerve passing through this part of the, the, the medial epicondyle, so assuming an anterior position. And uh, you will feel in the transducer, when you hold this transducer, you will feel the snap of the nerve just passing through uh, the medial epicondyle, and uh, sometimes you will, s will s uh, feel even the, the triceps tendon uh, doing the same uh, movement and luxating uh, after the, the ulnar nerve. And when you come back with the, the, the same movement, the nerve will snap again to the, the medial part of the, the, 
of the elbow again, and then you feel just holding the transducer here. So it's, it's very easy, and you have to do this, this movement when you evaluate ulnar nerve uh, pathology. And uh, just keep in mind that you can, you have to hold the, the, the hand of the patient, not to do a very um, sub, sub, uh, mm -hmm. sudden movement. And uh, you have to hold the, the transducer not so hard because if you hold it so uh, very hard, you can prevent the, the nerve to luxate. Uh, uh, for the, the, the medial epicondyle. So uh, this is something that uh, it's uh, advisable to, to train, to, to use your family to, to train the technique uh, before you do the, with the patient. And, and indeed, when we find in electroneuromography a mild uh, change in the velocity, for example, uh, in the elbow, uh, in the elbow region, and uh, sometimes the patient does not complain of any symptoms. And you, you come here, you see a mildly enlarged ulnar nerve. It's very common that this nerve uh, luxates uh, for the, the, the medial epicondyle. And during the, the daily uh, movement for work or for, for daily life tasks, uh, the patient scrubs the nerve uh, through the, the, the medial epicondyle and it hurts the nerve uh, until uh, sometime then he, he starts to have complaints of the nerve. So it's, it's uh, uh, important to advise the patient not to, to make movements uh, more than, than 45 degrees, for example, uh, because it will sc uh, scratch the nerve uh, through the, f the surface of the medial epicondyle and it, it will worsen the, the pathology. So let's see some uh, brachial plexus, Paulo. There is one question. Tunnel do carpo? So what is the the superiority, I, I can say this this way, what is the advantage of using ultrasound um, compared to electroneuromography for the diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome? I would not say that I would use only uh, ultrasound for diagnosing car carpal tunnel syndrome because I, I saw a lot of patients and I can compare uh, electroneuromyography with ultrasound findings, uh, and I did a lot of patients in my clinic just to, to learn, just to, to do my, my, my initial training, and I could um, see in these patients that there is no relation at all with the area of the, the medial nerve and the extent of the compromise in electro electrodiagnostic studies. So, uh, sometimes you have uh, uh, a very advanced carpal tunnel on uh, nerve conduction studies and you have n a not so large nerve at the wrist. So it's not uh, a good thing to use the area to infer about the extent of the compromise in carpal tunnel syndrome. It's better if you use both measurements because one can do it uh, functional status and the other one can give you anatomical information. So it's not, I, I recommend not push the, the ultrasound very much, uh, very much because you can uh, start to use this uh, uh, in a wrong way and it, it's not indicated for this kind of uh, evaluation. So use electroneurodiagnosis for uh, for knowing how is the nerve in the functional status and uh, do area measurements and look for other causes of carpal tunnel syndrome to give a complementary information about the anatomical status of the medial nerve. Uh, this is how I do. And it's important to do ultrasound uh, in the cases that will be operated because you can find uh, secondary causes of carpal tunnel syndrome and you can find 
bifid nerves with persistent uh, median artery. And this is an important information, especially in cases um, that will be submitted to endoscopic surgery um, because uh, the, sur the surgeon can damage this artery and this, uh, this is not good at all. So it's an important information to give to the surgeon. And uh, there are some findings in, in ultrasound that are very important for the secondary causes of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. So especially in cases where the electrodiagnostic studies are not that, uh, do not follow the, the, um, uh, the compromise that you expect, like first the sensory uh, compromise and then the distal motor latency is prolonged and then uh, the, the amplitude drop. Uh, when, when it does not follow this, uh, this timeline that you expect in carpal tunnel, uh, you have to suspect that maybe there is a secondary cause. And especially in these cases, uh, it's very, very recommended that you do ultrasound. So keep in mind that, for example, uh, lipomas of the tendons are uh, not so uncommon and it can be diagnosed uh, with ultrasound. And it's very important to, uh, to enlighten the surgeon, the surgeon about this uh, diagnosis because this can be uh, cured using surgery. And uh, for other causes like thrombosis of persistent median artery, for example, the only thing that, the only way uh, that you can diagnose is using ultrasound. So let's use uh, each method for uh, one, the method can give you the, the right answer. So for functional status, the electrodiagnostic studies, and for anatomic information, the ultrasound. And do not cross the line between both, because I think this is not, this is not good. One more question. So um, they're asking if uh, I think it's important uh, to examine all the entire nerve. For example, uh, the ulnar nerve from the wrist until uh, the armpit. I always do like this, and I, I always do uh, measurements in each major site. So I always do measurements at the pisiform bone, at the forearm, uh, cubital can, uh, canal, um, the, I don't remember, goteira, ulnar groove, mm -hmm. ulnar groove, uh, arm, and then more proximal in the arm, uh, like in the, the medial cord. And it's, it's very easy, I don't know uh, what should be the reason not to do this. And sometimes you are uh, surprised by some findings that uh, electroneurodiagnosis do not uh, give you. For example, uh, I had some patients with a schwannoma uh, proximal to the, the lesion. So a uh, patient has symptoms in the, the, the ulnar territory and maybe the distal uh, electrodiagnostic studies do not show you any abnormality. And if you do ultrasound just here, which would be the region of interest, you should uh, not uh, have the, the diagnosis of a schwannoma in a more proximal site. And I, ha I had some patients uh, that showed me uh, the importance of doing this examination until the more proximal site you can do. And for sure, I do not see a reason why we don't do this because it's so easy and it's, and it's so fast to do this until the proximal part. And this is not the, 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 the region that you will have problems. Yeah, you may have problems here because of fibrosis, for example, and sometimes you have to, uh, to invest a little more time in this region to examine adequately. But for extending the proximal side, it's not a big deal. So I recommend you to do so. And uh, we have sometimes patients who have symptoms in the hand and in electrodiagnostic studies, uh, they are completely normal, but uh, we could see, uh, I've seen, this year I've seen two times, 
uh, the patient had a stretching uh, lesion of the uh, profound, uh, the, the deep uh, branch of the ulnar nerve here at the Guillaume's canal. So it's important to, to keep in mind that sometimes ultrasound gives you an information that electrodiagnosis do not uh, give you. And this is the importance of learning how to do ultrasound when you are a clinical neurophysiologist. Any more? So let's move to the brachial plexus. Can you be a little bit closer to me? Let me just adjust settings here. And Paulo is a very good model for brachial plexus as well. He has a long neck and so we expect to see uh, very well the, the, the brachial plexus in, in him. So let me just uh, adjust that a little bit just to, to show you a more broad information here. So here is sternocleidomastoid, here is the jugular vein, carotid artery, and between those you can see vagus nerve here. So I can just push a little bit and you can still see, let me just, you can go a little bit earlier in the image and you can see the vagus nerve here and this is the, the thyroid. So in, at this level you will expect uh, to see the C6 uh, root and you can see here very easily the C5 root as well. Let me just, yeah, there is, it's adjusted. So here is anterior scalene muscle, here is uh, median scalene muscle, and here is C5 and it will give off the branch for uh, suprascapular nerve as soon as we, we hold, we go a little bit further. And here you can see C6. Uh, I'll, I'll just move a little bit uh, proximal. Let me just, let me see TGC here. And I just a little bit just to, to be a, li a little bit brighter. So uh, it's not so easy to see the the, the transverse process here, the anterior air and posterior tuber tubercle, but you can see uh, the shadow of the tubercle. Here you see the, the bone line and C6 here. And as soon as C6 uh, leaves the, the, trans the, the intervertebral foramen, uh, it splits. It's very easy to see uh, I split it here. And then we will see the posterior tubercle of C7, uh, which has a rudimentary anterior tubercle, and we will follow C7 root very shortly. And it's split again. And then here you will see a little bit more deeper uh, and not so easy to see, but here is C8. And here, here is the first rib as well. So you can see here the interscaline portion of the brachial plexus. It's aligned here, all the structures. And if you go down, let me just adjust that. If you go down, you will see the structures here in the supracavicular region. Qual preset? Which preset? This, this one? So I'm changing the preset to nerve. And then, no, I prefer the, the other one. I think I was Let me just move fo focus a little bit. 
bit more and adjust that. It was better, <laughs> the last option, <laughs> yeah. But you can see, you can still see. So here you see the, the structures of the brachial plexus. So you can see like a bunch of grapes that uh, is arranged near the, the subclavian artery. And it's important to, to follow this structure. So uh, when you begin to examine brachial plexus, uh, this is a, a trapezoid region, which is not so easy to, to learn how uh, it's easy, for example, to learn uh, median nerve. Uh, but if you study anatomy and you follow the structures with patients and doing this a lot of times, you will uh, see that it's very easy to, to identify this, these structures uh, following this from cranial to distal. So it's important to, to train a lot uh, to be able to do this kind of examination. And it's possible to, to see this kind of uh, structures in the infracarpicular region as well, but uh, sometimes it's not so easy to identify the structures. Let me see if I can uh, do it for you. Here you can see the pectoral muscles. And let me see if I can. It's not so easy to identify, but here is the, the subclavian artery. The, it will become the axillary artery very soon, and, and then the structures are um, beside and behind the artery. So if you have, let me just see if I can enhance a little bit the image and so you can imagine the, the structures here, here and here. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's easy to, to see. Huh? Huh? So uh, if you do this, you can easily follow the, the, the structures as well, so in the long view. And sometimes when the nerve is compromised, it's easy to, to see uh, the abnormality. So sometimes it's not easy to see uh, the structures if they are small and if they are normal because they are really uh, alike, the, the structures that uh, are around the, the, the nerve, but when you have pathology, uh, it's easy to identify. And, but to identify pathology, you have to do a lot of normal exams. Um, to get used to the images you expect for the normal uh, person, and to use this information to decide uh, that you are seeing a, a pathological condition. So this is, I think this is the main uh, the main problem when you learn ultrasound because you are not expected to see a uh, pathologist when you are in the phase of the, the first phase of learning ultrasound you are expected to see normal uh, people to learn anatomy first and then you move to uh, not so uh, difficult pathologies, uh, and then you move to difficult pathologies. So brachial plexus, I recommend that you uh, are able to, to see the, the, the structures of brachial plexus uh, when you finish learning the entire upper limb, for example. When you are comfortable doing median, ulnar, radial nerve, you move to the brachial plexus. Uh, for diaphragm, it's very easy, it's, it's very basic, so you can start learning from, from the basic uh, part. And I'll, when you finish the upper arm, it's the, the time for moving to the brachial plexus and for the, uh, the lower limb. Lower limb, it's not so easy too, but uh, when, you, when you're confident with the upper limb, it's the time to move uh, for the lower limb. So let's do some nerves. Question. Yeah, questions. Yeah. 
So my, in my experience, what is the, the best way to, uh, to calculate the area of the uh, B-feed median nerve? Uh, so you have to keep in mind that uh, sometimes the B-feed median nerve, uh, the two parts are together, but sometimes they are not together and they have a, a median artery in between them. So it's not possible to, to evaluate the area just outlining the entire structure and ignoring the, that there is a part inside uh, these two parts that it's not nerve, it's conjunct uh, connective tissue and maybe an artery as well. And this artery can be uh, enlarged. I've seen some uh, aneurysms, uh, aneurysms of the persistent median artery. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not good to, to measure the entire uh, area of the nerve considering two parts in the same block. So I always measure each one of the parts and uh, have calculate with the adding one, uh, the area one to another and then using this to, to, to infer about pathology of the median nerve. Uh, there are some people that uh, just consider um, a cutoff larger than the, the, the normal regular nerve and in my experience, I do not recommend this because I've seen so many different bifid, bifid nerves and some of them are together and some of them are very apart one from each other. So it's, it's not possible to measure uh, one structure. Measure two and add one area to the other. Another question? And what is most valuable use of ultrasound combination with needle? With needle EMG, yeah, uh, what is the most uh, important contribution of ultrasound with needle EMG? I think the first thing you, you consider when you, you think about ultrasound contributing to a needle EMG is to detect fasciculations. Uh, it's very easy to do with ultrasound and it's, uh, it's much more uh, easy than it's it's much more easy than doing with a uh, needle. So I prefer to to scan for fasciculations using ultrasound and look for the neurogenic pattern using electro electromyography needle examination. Uh, and it's very fast to to look for fasciculations, especially in some patients that you don't have to wait for too long to see the fasciculations happening. Uh, it's uh, recommended though that uh, when you put the, the, the ultrasound image, for example, uh, looking for biceps fasciculations, for example, you always are expected to wait for two minutes uh, to see fasciculation happen, just as you are, uh, you are advised to do uh, with needle exam too. So, it's not just only put, see, and give off, and then go to another, another place. You have to, to do the examination uh, respecting those times, too. But in some patients, it's so easy to see that you are not, you, you don't have the need to, to stay there for two minutes, because once you put the, 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 the transducer uh, to see the muscle, it happens uh, in a random fashion and so fast that uh, it's, you, you don't have to wait for two minutes. But for me, it's the main, the main reason. But uh, there is another reason uh, to use ultrasound when I plan my exam, my needle exam, uh, which is the children examination. Uh, I do not do children examination today without an ultrasound. So I plan my entire exam using ultrasound and I choose the muscles I will do uh, needle using uh, ultrasound because it's much more comfortable. And in my experience, parents uh, are much more relaxed when you plan the examination uh, like this and do not just randomly use a lot of muscles to, to search. So you reduce the, the pain in the, the exam and this is very important for children, especially for children. And sometimes for uh, 
elderly patients, I do use this approach too, because if they are uh, very ill, for example, and they are very tired for uh, about the, the, a lot of exams they are doing, uh, this is important to, to plan the exam too. So sometimes you do conduction nerve studies and do ultrasound and then choose the muscles uh, you need to put a needle in. I didn't show, and I just realized that, one uh, specific thing that I use a lot in my practice because I work uh, at the University of Sao Paulo with neuromuscular diseases and with a lot of uh, difficult problems uh, of diagnostic in children and adults with neuromuscular diseases and we are regularly using uh, ultrasound as part of the clinical examination uh, even before doing electroneuromography because I don't do electroneuromography at the university. I just do the, the ultrasound is exams in the ambulatory patients. And one of the, the, the parts of the examinations is seeing the tongue. So it's very easy to, to see. I'll just show you, it's a coronal view. And here, I'll just explain to you what I'm seeing. So that, let me, você não tem aqui convexidade, né, virtual? Tá. So um, sometimes you have uh, virtual convexity, which will enlarge the image a little bit, so you can uh, put all the structures in just one image. Here, you don't have it, but uh, you can see the structures very well. I, I just, I'll just uh, do one side and then show the entire uh, picture. So here is digastric. Here is myeloid. Here is here, genioioid and genioglossus. So you can see that here is uh, uh, a lymph node. So you can see the entire structure of the thong. And uh, for measuring, for example, uh, for seeing what is happening during uh, dysphagia, for example, and I, I ask the patient to swallow and I put the M mode uh, in the digastric muscle, for example. So these are very fast examinations that you can do uh, bedside and see what's happening to the, the patient. So in some, some patients, in some cases, it's very easy to, to identify abnormalities. So thong, diaphragm, uh, brachialis muscle, for example, they are very important in pompy patients. So uh, you can examine very fast and have a, a look uh, of what are the condition of the muscles and help with the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis. Let's see the lower leg. One more question. So suprascapular nerve. Uh, this is a, a, a difficult nerve to, to evaluate with ultrasound because it has a, a deep, uh, a deep uh, trajectory. Uh, so uh, you see the nerve um, leaving the C5. Let, let me see if I can show you using this. So. Here you have C5. Let me see if I can see the nerve leaving. Here. Play the show. Uh, yeah, here. So here you have the, the suprascapular nerve uh, leaving C5. Let me see if I can show. And if you do not um, identify the nerve here, there is another point that you can identify, which is below the homohyoid muscle here. So sometimes it's difficult to identify the nerve uh, in, in its entire 
length, but you can follow other uh, anatomical landmarks to follow the nerve. And there is another way to, to um, identify, which is examining the, in the, oh my god, yeah. Let me see if I can show. It's, sometimes it's not easy, but let's try. So you can try to identify the, the nerve, and I don't know if I can do it here with this machine because I would have to, to have a good, yeah, it, he is here, and uh, it's the, the, the notch that uh, he uh, enters to, to pass through the, the part of infraspinatus muscle, so it's the supra, supraspinal notch. And uh, the way that you identify this nerve uh, in pathological conditions, for example, is to put the Doppler here and to identify the artery that accompanies him. So sometimes it's not that easy to identify, like you, you have, for example, median nerve or, or ulnar nerve that you have uh, the, the, uh, you, you have the resolution to see the border of the nerve. So it's not that easy, but you can identify the nerve here knowing the landmarks. And uh, more important, I, I see that uh, sometimes you know, I think that people have, uh, are limited to the, the examination of these this difficult nerves, but uh, one thing that you have to keep in mind that is that you can always use muscles to infer about the condition of the nerve. So the ner if the nerve is pathological, the muscle will be compromised here. And you can always compare uh, the, the muscle. Let me just change focus to the point more distal. And let me see, yeah, here we have changed the, the TGT. And this uh, is changing my image. So when you see the muscle abnormally white, Keep in mind to, to, to check on the TGC uh, to see that if you do not change it and uh, you became the image brighter, but it's artifactual. So here is the normal trapezius and the supraspinatus. Uh, and you can see that the, normal, the muscle is normal, hypoechogenic with the fibers uh, with a lot of water, which is the normal content, and you can examine the infraspinatus as well, and you can see the, the, the muscular septum here. You can see that it's a very normal muscle. So when you do not, um, when you are not able to identify the, the suprascapular nerve, for example, look for the muscles, and you will always have the chance, for example, if, the, if it's uh, an, an with other side and to infer about uh, the compromise of the entire nerve or of the one of the branches for example so this is important let's do lower limb do you have well no so now we don't have any question and we'll do lower limb we have 10 minutes more 12 minutes more so I'll show you fibular nerve um, Keep on. Is she as a pet? Oh, okay. Let me see if it will be uh, clear for you to, to follow. Yeah. So here, lower limb are always lower limbs are always. Uh, more difficult than upper limbs. Yeah, there is one more question. So, uh, 
there is one more question uh, asking if I do quantitative examination in my regular practice or how can I examine the muscles. So normally in, in my regular practice, I do not do quantitative examination for everybody. Uh, if uh, we usually do quantitative examination for um, doing examinations uh, in different times of the presentation of the disease, for following some diseases, and now in the, the uh, ambulatory patients, I'm doing quantitative evaluation for analyzing the compromise of the muscles uh, in neurogenic conditions. So uh, quantitative examination requires you to capture the image, uh, to save it, to put it in your computer, and to use another software and encircles the muscle, choose the, the area you want to analyze, and then uh, ask for uh, the quantitative calculation of the histogram. So it's not very easy to do in a lot of muscles. So it's, this is the reason why. It's not part of my routine uh, examination in the clinic. But in some conditions, I can do this to follow this pathology over time uh, and um, to compare some muscles with other muscles in the vicinity, for example, to show uh, the, some specific pattern of, comp com of uh, compromise of the muscles. But it's not my routine. And it's, it's very easy for you to um, get used to the normal uh, ultrasound image of the, the, the muscles. And you, you get used to, to the changes that come with the aging process. So when you do a lot of exams, you will be uh, used to the, the normal image, the image that you expect, and you always uh, are expected to have some comparison uh, between sites when it's asymmetric, the pathology. And this, I think this is, uh, the only exception to this is for muscular dystrophies, for example, or for other generalized um, muscle involvement. So let's see here, uh, I am showing for you the sciatic nerve here. Uh, let me just, uh, look for yeah, some points of the image that the, the nerve are more, are more easy to, to see. So there is here the, this septum and this other one of the, the muscle that could, could be a little bit more difficult to see the nerve, to, to, to could do a, a lot of uh, attenuation in, in the, the sciatic nerve, but you are always uh, free to go a little bit uh, lateral and to toggle the transducer, for example, to see uh, the nerve in other parts of, uh, of its course. And this uh, makes you, makes the examination a little bit easier. So here, uh, let me just enhance again a little bit. Yeah, here the nerve is splitting. So this is the tibial part, and this is the fibular part, and this is biceps femoris. And we can follow uh, both nerves uh, if we want. Uh, the tibial one, it's, it's more difficult to follow the entire length uh, during the entire course in the leg. Uh, sometimes it's possible for uh, a great length of the nerve because people sometimes are thin and very good, have very good muscles, but uh, it's not the, the regular situation. The regular situation, uh, after he passes through the uh, popliteal fascia, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult. But here uh, you have the uh, fibular nerve, and you will have the nerve following its course until the fibular head, which is here. So Sometimes you have another structure um, proximal to the fibular head. Be aware of that you, uh, you, have, uh, you can have this structure. It's named Fabella. So clearly identify and look for the leg uh, to see that you are really 
at the, the fibular head. And once you identify the fibular head, it's easy to see uh, the nerve just uh, beside it. And then you can follow the fibular nerve uh, going down, and it first uh, divides in, into uh, deep and superficial uh, branches. And uh, sometimes you can follow the entire course of the nerve in the leg. It's not uh, so easy, and sometimes you have to, to, to do adjustments uh, on the frequency of the transducer you are using. But it's possible if you spend some time, it's possible. Uh, the point is that uh, the main region of interest is here. So it's not that easy that you have to follow the nerve in its entire course uh, here. And when you um, follow this nerve distally, só dobra aqui para mim. You will find it again the, the superficial branch. Let me just, yeah, focus is adjusted. This is the fibula uh, bone, fibular bone, the peroneal bone. And then uh, here is the superficial uh, fibular nerve. So it's very easy to follow, and, and then you can follow it distally. And uh, if you want to, you have, you, you have the possibility to follow its course um, in the, the mus in, inside the muscle uh, in proximal in the leg. So it's up to you to, to decide if you want to spend some time following it. But it's very easy to follow the nerve in its course uh, through distal. And you can see it even when it branches uh, in the dorsum of the foot. And another nerve that it's important in, the, in this position um, is the sural nerve. So uh, what you have to do, you are expected to find, let me just change this position, just to, to have more freedom uh, with the transducer here. And you have to find the saphena parva vein. Uh, let me just find it. And if you do not find very easily the, the vein, let me see. You can always compress a little bit the leg, sometimes it's useful. So you can see more easily the veins in the subcutaneous tissue there. And then you can look for the, the nerve, uh, which I, uh, it seems to be here. And another way to, to follow this nerve is to follow from distal to, to proximal. So you can always uh, see Achilles tendon, and then you look for the vein here, and the veins are not that big, so that's why it's a little bit difficult, but I think the nerve is here in my experience, and we can follow this proximal, and uh, yeah, it's, this is the, the sural nerve. And you can follow it proximally. This is the saphena parva uh, vein. And you can follow its proximal course. So uh, it's important to know anatomy when you examine the patient and to do a lot of normal examinations uh, to be able to have this, um, this uh, uh, to feel safe uh, in the identifying pathological conditions you will only be able to identify pathological conditions if you are safe with the normal anatomy. And now, the tibial nerve, I'll just uh, look it in the ankle. Vira para mim, Paulo. And this is our last part. So uh, what I do is I ask the patient to flex the knee like this. And I put the, the area of exam, oh, sorry. 
easier for me to, to do the examination because uh, doing ultrasound is like doing electroneumography. You have to keep in mind that you can hurt yourself, uh, especially shoulders. When you do a lot of exams, holding your arms still in the, with no uh, support, so uh, you are better and longer uh, uh, ultrasonography if you have uh, a good position and you put yourself in a, in a comfort position to see the nerve. So here, uh, let me just, yeah go a little bit proximal. So here you have the tendons here. So tibial posterior, flexor digitorum longus. And here you have the artery and veins. You can compress the veins and you will see that the artery becomes uh, pulsating here. And you are it's very easy to identify the, the tibial nerve uh, beside this, uh, these veins here and the, the artery. So uh, this is another uh, screen that you have to uh, keep in your mind to, to identify the tibial nerve. It's very easy when you identify the tibial posterior tendon, flexor digital longus, and then uh, the veins, the artery, and the nerve. And if you, you can go proximal, with this, this nerve and to see it more proximal. It's very easy to, to do this. And you can go more distal and if you go, go more distal, you will see uh, very easily the division in medial uh, plantaris nerve and lateral plantar nerve. And you will see here uh, the calcaneus nerve, uh, the branch leaving the nerve as well. So you will see here the calcaneus branch and then you can follow this branch, uh, especially when it's pathological. Like for example, uh, in leprosy patients, you will see this branch very enlarged very often. So it's very easy to uh, do a longitudinal image even for the calcaneal nerve. And here you see that there are uh, parts of the lateral here and the medial plantar nerve, so that's why we do not uh, see the nerve in a, in a single trunk. And here, when it's not splitted, you see the tibial nerve in a single uh, trunk in the longitudinal view. So that's all. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this live demonstration. And we almost did. Uh, a full examination of the entire body with a lot of regions. So I hope you enjoy it and that uh, this encourages everybody to learn more ultrasound and to, to use it to enhance your ability as a clinical neurophysiology or as a neurologist or as a radiologist, uh, whatever, uh, to enhance your uh, diagnostic power and to help patients with correct diagnosis. Thank you very much.